reaction at all. As opposed to the rest of us who are always on vacation. <laughs> Bill, Bill, okay. Phil, you're talking about prioritization for the um the funds. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Well, I'm um, expecting that we're gonna money's gonna start getting tighter, and we may need to uh, just have a review of what are the region's needs uh, in context of where Jayla's been doing her planning. And uh, just to, just to make sure we have that, which might help facilitate. And I'm naive, uh, Donna. So uh, for Donna and Don, uh, seeing as how I haven't been on the allocation committee, but I thought it might be a good thing to uh, just kind of refresh a little bit and have that discussion. I, I think that's great, Phil. Good idea. So, Mindy. Okay. Ada Anderson. Here. Andrea Suhaka. Here. Barbara Boyer. I'm here. We know Bob is here. Chris Lynn. Good morning. Connie Ward. Dave Appel. Here. Don Perez. I'm here. Donna Mullins. Here. Ed Moss. George Peel. Greg Kaler. Here. Gretchen Lopez. Here. Good morning. Jim Dale. Here. Judy Kern. Justin Martinez. Lisa Ferret. Present. Paul Hazeman. Here. Perla Geller. Here. Bill Cernanick. Present. Sean Wood. Sherry Haid Vogel. Here. Sharon Tessier. Steve Conklin. Tama Howald. Valerie Robson. Thought I saw her on. She's on. No, yeah. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Win Shaw. I'm here. Okay. And um, Connie got on, Mindy. Did Connie get on? Thank you. All right. Um could we have any guests uh, let us know who they are and where you're from? Debbie Haney, Executive Director, Cast Rock Senior Center. Jennifer D'Ambrosio, Douglas County. Anyone else? Um, I'm Morgan Baskell. I'm here from Senior Support Services. And I believe we've got Chitty here as well. Yeah, I'm here, Chitty, uh, co-director of case management at Senior Support Services as well. Okay, great. Welcome. Thanks. Okay. And then we just have uh, a lot of other uh, Dr. Cog employees that are on the line today. Okay, thanks. And I'd like uh, to mention that Greg Kaler is here from Adams County. It's his first meeting, so I hope everybody welcomes him. Welcome. Hi, Greg. <laughs> Paul Hazeman is also new with us today, and Paul is part of the Dr. Cog board. Okay, great. All right, thank you, folks. Um, so I'll now open it up if uh, any of our uh, the public would like to make a public comment. Does, does anybody have anything they want to say before we get started outside of the folks who are on, on here usually? No. Okay. So, so the next item on the agenda is report of the chair, and the chair doesn't have anything to report. So we'll we'll move right on from that. And uh, 
ask for a motion to approve the uh, consent agenda, which is the minutes from the last meeting. So, so mo and okay. I'm sorry. Who, and who, Phil. Who motion? Andrea and Phil. Yes, both. Mm -hmm. And I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. If, Aye. You, know, you don't have to say anything. If you're not in favor, don't. You know, if you're not in favor, raise your hands. But okay. Valerie has her hand up. Oh, sorry. I put my hand up before Bob said to put your hand up only if you don't approve. <laughs> Okay. Sorry, Bob. I was being proactive. I, I realized my mistake pretty late, so sorry about that. Um, okay. So, so, Bob, I have have a, a correction to the spelling of Jen's name in the minutes under guests. Uh, Jen, you're on. You're on, so you can confirm this. But her, the spelling of her last name is D apostrophe A M B R O S I O, I believe. Perfect, Gretchen. Sorry, I missed that. Thank you. Uh-huh. Okay, I'll make that correction before I Thank post you. It. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Ben. Thank you, Gretchen. Okay. okay. So if there's uh, nothing else, we're going to move right into our informational briefing, starting with Rich Morrow. Is Rich on? I'm not sure Rich is on yet. Okay, I guess we got uh, got ahead a little bit. Way ahead. Well, <laughs> well, why don't we Why don't we move on to the next person then? That would be uh, Morgan Basco with uh, Senior Support Services and Chitty as well. So, do you have a PowerPoint that you'd like to show, or are you just going to talk to us about it? Um, I think we're happy to just chat for now. I do have a video I want to share um, that just gives kind of more of an overview. Okay. Um, let me see if I can manage. Let me give you some permissions here. Oh yeah. Let's see. Can I just send you a link to it? Does that work? Um, I'll just go ahead and let you link it up. Okay. Yeah, we had um elevating Denver, part of like the Denver media came out and did. A wonderful little video for us last summer so i think it's a good introduction as to all the stuff we're doing but um Trudy can definitely talk more specifics once we get there um i guess it's not gonna let me you'll have to send me that and i'll see if i can hook it up yeah no worries <laughs> um so let me send this and then basically as an introduction um we are a nonprofit day shelter here in Denver, we serve exclusively people um, age 60 or older, and we um, work on a wide variety of issues related to poverty. Um, so we serve about 1,500 people every year. Um, the majority of our people are um, either housing insecure, so even if they're not um, unsheltered homeless, we have a lot of folks who are, you know, moving between motels and apartments, people who are being evicted or they're living with family or in a lot of different situations. Um, so one of the most important services that we provide, the one that probably gets the most people in the door is meals. We served around 40,000 meals last year. Um, so our day center has, you can come in, you can get meals, you can get hygiene items. We have a clothing bank. We have access to computers. We have um, a mail room, which is really important for a lot of our people experiencing housing instability, right? Because having to change your address all the time or not having a set address, that works really well. Um, so that's kind of our day center operations. And then I'll let Chitty talk more about our um, case management operations, which is really, um, really, really broad because we help um, everybody with whatever issue they're bringing to the door. It is um, really client centered which is awesome, but definitely challenging. Oh yeah, uh, let's see, I see Phil's raising a hand, but definitely. Real quick question, Morgan, yeah. uh, where are you located? We are on 18th and Emerson. So we're right across from St. Joe's. Mm -hmm. So we don't, um, we're not like limited service wise to certain counties, uh, but obviously the majority of people we see are in the like Denver Metro area. Thank Excellent. You. And thank you for that uh, 
Morgan. Um, so my name is Chidi. I'm one of the co-directors, <clears throat> excuse me, here at Senior Support Services. And like Morgan mentioned, you know, we do offer numerous services to kind of meet the needs of our senior population within the city and surrounding um, metro area. Um, one of our big focuses um, is on case management. Um, case management really encompasses a lot of different kind of dynamics and um, needs. You know, one, our individuals and the members that we serve don't necessarily need to be you could, well, you can be a member without receiving case management. Oftentimes, people want to get comfortable first before they decide to go further in with whatever their needs are. Um, but with case management, we work on anything from like benefit acquisition, housing, you know, individuals getting birth certificates and licenses for the first time, really any need um, or task that a member wants to do to move themselves forward, we assist them with in case management. Um, you know, oftentimes it does incorporate kind of looking for housing. So we, you know, do everything related to that, whether it's help with the application process, um, getting vital documents, like I was mentioning earlier, birth certificates, IDs, uh, social security cards, um, even for benefits, whether it's helping individuals apply for like social security benefits, early retirement, um, disability benefits, even state benefits, um, which include old age pension for individuals who are about 60 to 62, um, SNAP benefits, as well as, you know, Medicaid and Medicare. So, you know, we tend to be a low barrier center. Um, so it allows individuals to basically come as they are without any judgment. Um, but also, you know, we have goals that we work towards in a trauma and formed approach because it's not necessarily the extent of what, you know, individuals' traumas are, but um, instead we try to just recognize that everyone experienced some level of trauma. So we're cautious of how we um, navigate in each individual's um, specific needs. Yeah. Um, and I'll just add on to what Chitty's saying there with, um, I think the client population that we serve is similar to a lot of the other Dr. Cog providers, right? And that we're all serving people over age 60, but we are, um, most of the people that we're serving are people who've experienced a lot of trauma that's that's uh, really contributed to the chronic homelessness issues that, that people are facing. So th there's like a national trend, right? Of people over age 55 are the fastest growing group of people experiencing homelessness. So what we're really starting to see nationally is this big trend of, older adults becoming homeless for the first time. But we're not seeing that at seniors yet as much. We still are seeing a lot of people who have um who are who are chronically homeless, who are experiencing issues related to um past trauma, interpersonal violence, uh like criminal legal issues, a lot of people with family, like fractured family relationships, uh chronic health issues. Uh, I think we do have quite a few veterans. I think we're about a quarter of our members are veterans. Um, yeah. But we also have, I think it's like 85% yeah. of people are um, experiencing like a mental health issue or a chronic health issue. About 90% of the people that we serve are yeah. homeless alone or they live alone. So there's um, some real issues going on with isolation and socialization. Um like I think it's a solid three quarters of our people are physically frail or disabled. So there's definitely a lot of compounding factors that make that low barrier idea so important to us. So you don't have to get case management, right? You don't have to, first of all, you don't have to do anything to become a member. You don't have to, you don't have to have an ID. You don't have to fill out all these documents. You come in, you talk with our intake manager, you can get any of the services that we offer. You don't have to do any of them, right? It's not like you know, if you're going to get case management, you have to come in twice a week, or if you're going to get uh, hygiene items, then you have to get a tooth, you know, you can have to get a toothbrush or you have to get toothpaste. Like it's, we try and really be client directed and client led. Um, on that note, I will say we definitely, the big, our biggest source of referrals is members, like members just talking to their friends and being like, oh my gosh, come see Chitty. Like, you know, he'll help you with this. He'll do that. But um, we are also working closely with a lot of community organizations. So I would definitely encourage you guys to spread the word uh, to your case managers that might be needing that extra support with the unique situations that our, that our clients are in. 
So okay. you can easily reach out on our website or anyone can stop by our building. We're open from uh, seven to two, seven. Monday through Friday. Yeah. Um, and just to kind of highlight the importance of what we do as well with us being a day center that specifically serves individuals that are 16 older, um, you know, numerous members, members have expressed the importance of having a place that they can come to that um, they can share similar experiences, similar um, circumstances with individuals that are like minded via age or experience. Um, oftentimes, some of the other shelters that individuals have to stay at tend to incorporate a vast range, age range, so they're not one easily um, or as easy to relate to everything that's going on. Um, sometimes they just want to be amongst peers um, where they feel a bit more comfortable, especially with um, our senior population being a vulnerable population. So, you know, this also serves as a location where, you know, for instance, with the blizzard that occurred, you know, we do have individuals who sleep outside, unfortunately, and, um, you know, feel like they can come here at least for the day to have somewhere to stay warm, um, get, you know, um, the meals that we offer and the support they need. So, you know, I know it's not as well known about what a lot of the senior population um, experiencing homelessness or economic stability are kind of going through. But, you know, the longer we work here, I think, you know, we're able to shed a bit more light on that um, as a community, um, just so that, you know, this population is supported uh, through and through. So. So I, I had a question for either either or both of you. Um, so uh, two questions, actually. One is. If somebody shows up at your door and they're 40 years old, what, what do you do with them? And, and then the second one is, where do you get your funding? So I can answer the first question. So individuals who are not um, of age, um, when they do come in, we kind of will still, you know, some of them will come in hungry or maybe need a bit of clothing or shoes. So we still try to support on that level, even though they cannot become members, but we do have a resource list that we offer individuals who are below our age range to be able to still acquire um, services and supports that they need. So if they do come by, they don't leave empty handed, they still will either get some type of support or um, resource information. Yeah. Okay. David Pell has his hand up and then Phil Cernanic for questions. Yes. Um, and then, so as for that second part with funding, so we um, it's, it's changed a lot over the years. So senior support actually started in 1976 with all the downtown redevelopment. There was kind of this, uh, a bunch of faith organizations realized that older adults were being displaced. So they started the day center to mostly focus on housing. Then it expanded to focus on meals. Um, and now I think we do a pretty even split between meals and, and case management. Um, so it is a little, it is a little tricky, right? Because there's funding for homelessness which oftentimes focuses on youth and families and employment, not exactly the issues that our folks are having. And then there's funding that's directed toward older adults, which is often focused on aging in place and chore services um, and home accommodations, which also issues that our, our folks aren't dealing with. So we definitely, um, we do get a pretty substantial amount of funding from Dr. Cog for our case management program. Um, and for our outreach and information assistance type of work and for our mental health program. So we have um, Chitty and our other director of case management are um, licensed social workers who provide mental health support. And we also have a professional counselor who comes in to do mental health support. Um, so um, a lot of that is funded by Dr. Cog. We also get funding from the Denver Office of Housing Stability, HOST. So um, we, they funded a couple different programs for us. Um, right now, we have a really great program through them that is helping people with rent assistance, which is super exciting, direct funding. Um, but most of the funding for our day center program, so like all of the um, all of the funding for our, you know, uh, like facilities staff and for our utilities and general operating and admin and sticky notes and front desk people and phones. Uh, most of that is through private foundations or individual donors. Okay, thank you. And we had other questions. Uh, who who was next, Mindy? Yeah. David Pell had a question, and then there was yeah. Phil, and I have a one in the chat. Hey, Morgan okay. and Chitty, thank you so much for being here. I love what your organization does. I got a couple questions for you. Um, and I just want to make sure 
if I know people, I'm referring people appropriately. And I think that the information is good for the group. Um, first, are you taking on new people for your case management stuff right now? Yes. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Monday through okay. Friday, we are taking in new members. Okay. Um, next question is, okay, so I'm out here in Lakewood. How would they connect with you? Would they have to walk through your door or would it be a phone call? Both. How does that work for you guys to make it as easy as possible to get somebody in need to you guys? So I think it really depends on the individual situation. Um, I just put our contact form from our website in the chat. If you have someone who you're not sure if they're a good fit for our services or you're, they're not even sure what they need, I think that would be the place to start is just reaching out and saying like, hey, this is the situation. Is this something you guys can do? If they're already connected to an advocate, their advocate can reach out and we can kind of help them do that resource navigation. Otherwise, if you do have someone who is more independent um, and knows the, the exact resources they need, I would encourage them to come in. We try to limit um, phone intakes just because of our staff capacity. So I would say have them come in anytime between seven and two. Um, we're right on, uh, we're right on the bus line. Um, you just, they'll just sign up on the intake sheet at our front desk, have a 20, like probably 20 to 40 minute conversation with our intake manager who will kind of talk about to, who will get all that information that we need for our, our grantors and then kind of talk about what, what services we offer and what they might, what they might need. Terrific. My last question, and I'm sorry to give you three, but, no. um, long time ago, you guys used to do a lot with transitional housing or assisting with transitional housing. Is that something you guys still help under your case management or in the work that you guys do or not so much these days? So I think it really, we still do, but it depends the individual um, and kind of the spacing um, between, um, you know, going from one location to another. But we we still do try to support individuals with that for sure. Okay. Um, it's just, it just depends really the individual circumstance and kind of like the what this um kind of what the situation is, but we try to make sure that individuals don't have that gap um between being housed um if we can definitely prevent it. Thank you. I mean, and that makes a whole lot of sense that it's case by case depending on the situation and what's going on. Um I totally get it. And that's definitely something that some of our older folks come up against where their rents go up and up to the point where they can't afford to live in their current building for whatever reasons they quote unquote remodel or whatever. And they are fearful that they're going to end up in a shelter. And and I've seen a bunch of folks do that and then transition out. But that's a good talking point for me. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Of course. Yeah. Thank you for the questions. And we always encourage people. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You, you might have answered this question already, but does someone have to be unhoused and homeless to be served? No. Not so as our low all. barrier model, anyone over 60 can become a member. So we have no income or employment or ability restrictions or location restrictions. Anybody over age 60 can come in, become a member. And then once you're a member, you can receive all of the services that we offer. So we have a ton of people, um, uh, for Sherry's question, a ton of people that are just coming in to hang out, right? A ton of people who are just coming in to, you know, maybe they, we have a, a lot of people who have been members for like 10, 15, like even 20 years, right? Um, a lot of our folks like went to high school together at East, you know? And so they, like there are, you know, every people are friends, people are hanging out. We got like, um, I'm trying to think, we do our client satisfaction survey, right? And we have a bunch of like, uh, I forget the exact quote, but it's like, someone was like, I love having a place where I can hang out with some other old people, you know, or like, oh, I met my wife here or like, you know, it, it definitely is a pretty fun, we try and make it a more fun social environment um, in our day center. So yeah, people are more than welcome to just come, come hang out. Yeah. Yeah. We've had members who like Morgan was kind of highlighting, who's been here for, you know, plus 10 years and never received um, case management once, but they come here for the environment, um, some of the other things that we offer, as well as just the community. Um, so yeah, just only requirement is $60. Mm -hmm. $60. Yeah. People coming in to check their mail, people coming in to like mm -hmm. check on the computers. You know, we'll often have the DMV will come out or um, we'll have vaccine clinics or we have mobile dentists come out. Um, so people are coming to get other services or they're just coming to like hang out, you know, or get some reading glasses or grab some ibuprofen or 
you know, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, we also have a lot of people that will come in with, um, you know, just like random questions for case managers. It's not like they're like looking to be housed immediately. Right. But they want help interpreting this letter from their landlord. Like they don't really know what it means or they're looking to vent, right? Like my office is right down the hall from Chitty's. And let me tell you, the amount of people that come in, they're like, Chitty, I just have to tell you what happened today. And like, it's, um, yeah, definitely a social environment. And then Sherry, with the rest of your question, no cost. So all of our yeah. programs are provided 100% free to all of our members. So that's, um, you know, all the meals, all the hygiene items, our clothing bank, the computers, the mail, the case management. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. And then I know okay. we had, I see um, Andrea's hand up, but I know we had one more person. Mindy, do you know who that was? Yes. Phil. Oh, perfect. <laughs> um, uh, Morgan and Chitty, uh, thank you so much because uh, navigation uh, needs are important. I was wondering, uh, do you have parking spaces or uh, other than uh, the folks taking the bus, uh, how did they get there? And then I'll ask the second question as well, so you can get to that, which is you mentioned members. And the question is, what does it take to be a member? Because it sounded like you would also take walk-ins that aren't members. And uh, what's what's involved in that? And uh, is there special privileges for members? Yeah, um, just to clarify that last question, I'll let Chitty get in the transportation thing because he'll know more about that. But we go back and forth between members and clients. Like pretty much once you do an intake, you're a member and that's it. It just means we have your info on file so that when you, if you do need case management, we can help you with that. Or if we are looking for, um, you know, so we can let funders know who we're serving. And so we can have that information going forward to inform programming, right? Of like, who are we serving? You know, where are we seeing people? What services do they want? So yeah, all you have to do to be a member is come in. And once you come in, you you're a member and you can't get yeah. out. <laughs> um, to answer the second question, as far as with parking, so we don't have necessarily assigned parking for the center. Um, so oftentimes there's street parking um, because we do run down 18th. Individuals will take the 20 and just cross the street and our center's right there. So there's no designated parking for clients, but that still hasn't prevented us from being full. Um, so the individuals that do drive normally, they do find parking on the streets surrounding our building, um, or oftentimes individuals take um, the bus um, to us and it just directly is across the street from where the 20 drops them off on 18th and Emerson. Mm -hmm. Well, and we also um, are lucky to have some RTD funding where we can offer people bus passes if that's something they need. So people can do, um, you know, people can do the park and ride type of thing. Yep. Sharon, Dr. Yep. Cobb, funds, um, yep. actually they fund our monthly bus pass program, which is awesome. So we have, I don't want to advertise that too much because it's one of our hottest commodities. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we still have about 150 people on our waiting list for it, but we have 200 people who every month we give them a monthly bus pass, which is really awesome. And we get such good feedback on um, just how much that helps with stability in terms of being able to... Um, you know, get out of the house and being able to do your shopping and run errands and go to the doctor and socialize. Um, so, yeah. Uh, would this really would this important. be a good, would this be a good time to show your video? Um, 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 do we want to take Andrea's question first, Bob? Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, forget well, that. Well, and I just wanted to say that Phil stole my question, so I'm <laughs> good. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, Phil does that all the time. He's always stealing people's questions. So, um, And then while you're getting the video ready to share, I will say, you know, obviously most of the services that we offer are tailored to low income people, but that's definitely, again, not a requirement at all. Anyone of any income over 60 can become a member. And we are also always looking for volunteers. You know, we get a lot of like high school kids that want to volunteer, which like, Darn, our schedule doesn't really work with that, right? But we're all if people want to come in and do um, you know, like an art class, or we had people come in and do a movie day, or um, you know, even we've had volunteers come in with like just with like coloring sheets and hang out, you know, like we're always we're all we're um because we're so small, we can be really flexible and we're always looking for stuff to, you know, stuff to do. Our little you could see our community room right there, right on the on the left of the screen like 
you know, we'll have, yeah, like I said, we have vaccine clinics, we have the mobile dentist, but we could probably have more fun stuff as well. If you, um, people are interested in volunteering, I know we're on the Dr. Cog list. So I just wanted to put that out there. Okay. All right. Here we go. How I got involved with the center was that uh, after 36 years of my life spent in, uh, in prison, it's kind of embarrassing to talk about it, but coming out of there, back into society, I was lost. This is how I looked when I first came here. I was already two years on the streets, out of prison, no direction. After a year or so, that's me today. So this, just these little items here, expresses everything that I want to express to the people out there that is listening. They are meeting out here in the center, though they may not ask for it. But I and others here in the center appreciate everything that the center does for us. This saved my life, basically, it saved my life. So originally, Senior Sports Services was just a place where people could drop in, have a cup of coffee, and maybe one meal. A number of faith organizations in downtown Denver were concerned because of all the seniors who were being evicted due to the redevelopment of lower downtown. And we have become, since, a client-centered, low-barrier day shelter for homeless seniors. We are open every weekday from 7 a.m. until 2 p.m. Clients can come here, get meals, socialize, and it's really one-stop shopping for them because we also offer them what I call comprehensive, individualized <laughs> case management services. Um, oftentimes, I think kind of the needs of seniors, unfortunately, kind of fall under the radar. So unless we're the ones kind of presenting what's going on, not everybody really understands that. So really any opportunity that we have that we're able to advocate for seniors, we do that. Every individual situation is different, but we wait for what they present to us as we well, that helps us direct case management. So individuals may want to come in and just talk or then no problem. Individual may want to come and recertify some benefits that they receive mail on that's due. No problem. Individuals might want to look into housing options. Um, so we support them with really whatever they want from us or need from us. Uh, I was homeless for three years. This place got me a, got a place for me uh, five months ago. And I have to say, I love the staff here. I'm telling you, I, they helped me the, they helped me the most, more than any other facility I went to. This is the best that I know. Of. That's the truth. I love it. I love it over here. I love it. I really do. I came in and seen people that they treat you nice. They can't help you. That all the case managers and stuff, they help you. You know, when they can do everything, just so they, I don't feel like I got to fight against the world. I can't win. Uh, but and then I started having feeling good for my, to myself. And this is I get normal here. You know, they help us a lot. We used to have a case manager here. Oh, uh, we used to always say, oh. Uh, this was a place for people who other people didn't want. That really hit me, you know, because uh, just the way he said it, these are the people that nobody wants out there. And uh, I guess you can say there's a lot of need out there. And uh, it's just so good to uh, be able to serve these people serve our clients and uh they're human you know uh it's just the enjoyable experience that i've had here the most rewarding piece of this work for me um is really the real time like actions and solutions you really see the work you're doing take effect i can't really specify um i can just give instances of 
success, but every day is a success when we work with seniors, meet needs, whether it's food needs, whether it's clothing needs, whether it's just providing a space of like peers where they can relate to each other. It's all, you know, it's all great for me. Look, you get my age and your your kids are already gone and things. And I don't have, my husband died in 2008. So right now, being here, and talking to these people make me feel like a, a person, important. And, but I need to be here because sometimes you get lonely. And so this helps me a lot to uh, know people, to do the computer, to read a book, to do bingo. This helps me to kind of like them feel important. I'm going to say important for with my, within myself. Within myself. I was I was a junkie. Ex convict. I was a junkie. Uh, that's what I was. That's no longer me today. Today I am what I am. And I'm grateful to the center for that. If you see us, say hi. If you want to donate, definitely. But just trust that the work we're doing here will continue and we're going to constantly take care of the seniors that need us. Stay elevated by subscribing to the city's YouTube page for these stories and more. Hmm. Well, that was great. Thank, thanks so much for sharing that with us. That's, uh... Yeah. Um, and then I'm seeing Connie's question in the chat about how many seniors um, rely on us today. I think it's kind of a, it is difficult because we have that low barrier model, right? So we'll have members who will come in, um, you know, they'll come in a few times, they'll get help with whatever issue they're, you know, needing help on, they'll get help with the recertification. We won't see them for a couple of years, but, or th then they'll be back. Right. Or they'll come in just for meals for a while. Um, you know, then they'll move on and then they'll come back. Right. Or, um, it's, it really depends. We definitely, so we see between, I would say probably, um, like 25 and, and 75 people on, on the average, the average day, sometimes it'll get pretty busy. We'll see like a hundred Hundred, I think we had like 150 people at each of our, at our like winter breakfast things. We definitely um, do tend to be busier more toward the end of the month, just because that's when people's benefits are running out. So people will come in for, you know, breakfast and lunch. We have, um, you may, you probably saw in the video, we have a sack lunch program to go. Um, that's another awesome volunteer opportunities um, for, especially for organizations that don't have a ton of time. We have a bunch of, um, school and church and like corporate donors that, you know, they'll do, they'll meet once a month. They'll put together a bunch of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. They'll pack all the lunches. It takes them 45 minutes and then just one person drops them off. Um, but it's a really nice option for our members to then be able to take that meal to go. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for uh, Chitty or Morgan? Oh, I also would be remiss if I didn't mention we are doing our big fundraiser, um, our beer and wine tasting. We're bringing it back. Um, we did it before the pandemic, but it's going to be in City Park on June 8th. So mm -hmm. I will I'll definitely send out info for that to everybody. But keep an eye out. Should be fun. OK. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. OK, we're going to uh, to move on to uh, is Rich on now? Rich, are you here? If not, maybe I'll try and give him a call. Yeah. Okay. Why don't you do that? And in, in the meantime, um, uh, do we have Don, is Donna Zimmerman on? Okay. Well, we'll we'll see if uh, Mindy can get a hold of Rich and then. We'll move on after that. In the meantime, does anybody else have anything they'd like to share while we're waiting? <clears throat> Bob, I can talk a little bit about uh, what we discussed in our Dr. Cog board meeting, if that is helpful. That would, that would be great. Thank you. Great. Go ahead. We actually talked a little bit about uh, community-based transportation planning and some of the updates to that. Uh, uh, we talked about a corridor planning 
uh, pilot program in two different corridors, Alameda and um, uh, up north around Highway 7 um, uh, that, are, that are being piloted along with the communities. We also talked about the freight plan, Colorado freight plan, and that spurred quite a bit of discussion. It was very, very interesting uh, to see, uh, you know, some of the things that CDOT has done to try and reinforce bridges and uh, to make it easier for freight to get around um, the city and uh, and the mountains and, um, you know, where the accident hotspots were. So that was fascinating. And then uh, the rest of the meeting, we pretty much dedicated to talking about the bills uh, that were coming up that, you know, and how to take a position on those that involved either transportation or um, older adults or, the um, um, somehow the the legislature has started looping Dr. Cog in and trying to assign responsibility without funding. So we have to kind of combat that. But um, it, it's it was definitely uh, an interesting meeting. So I hope that helps. That does help. Thanks, Wynn. And our, our legislature would actually enact legislation and not provide any funding. <laughs> yeah, amazing. those unfunded mandates, they they kind of like those. Yeah, yeah, they, uh, the feds like those too. So, yes, anyway. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> well, so we have the, the Dr. Cog board report. Thanks, Wynn. Um, Mindy, are you back? Yep, I'm back. He he said to give him about five minutes. He was just wrapping up a meeting he had to get on. So okay. um, he'll be right there. Did did you tell them, Wayne, that you're the new Dr. Cog board chair? I did not, but I, I will. Yes. <laughs> I'm the new Steve Conklin. <laughs> and, uh, and the new me is Jeff Baker from Arapahoe County. He's the new vice chair. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> And uh, congratulations, man. Thank you. Yeah, and um, Bob Moss may have a question. Looks like, it, yeah, it does. Oh, I can unmute myself. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> mute myself, so I would, didn't know if I could unmute myself. Um, uh, last meeting and uh, one of the last reports, there was a discussion about the uh, Meals on Wheels difficulty in Adams County. And I just checked with Broomfield. You know, we we only have seventy five thousand people in our county. It's much more manageable than a lot of places. We don't have the geographic dispersion, but we have no waiting list whatsoever for Meals on Wheels in Broomfield County. Uh, we get a lot of support uh, from the city and county and city council. So, um, just want to throw out some good news on top of all the daily tragedies that we deal with. Well, okay, thank you. It's good to hear. Who, who distributes meals on wheels in Broomfield County? It is the county itself. County itself, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, another thing while we're waiting for Rich, um, and by the way, has Don Zimmerman joined yet? Uh, let's see. Do we have any uh, county reports? Um, let's just see if anybody has anything from any of the counties and while we're waiting. So let's start with Jefferson County. Do we have anything from Jefferson County? Donna, Connie? Um, well, Connie could be speaking to this because she's running the whole thing, but our Senior Heroes event is coming May 9th, and that's always a very special thing for Jefferson County, honoring the senior volunteers. It sounds like Connie has it well under control. Okay. And where, where is that, Donna? It's going to be at the Apex Center on Wadsworth. 
in Arvada, across from the Arvada Center. Okay. And that's something you buy tickets for, if I remember right. Connie? I don't think so. Is she, Connie, are you here? She's in chat saying she can't unmute. Let me see if I can unmute her. I don't think we buy tickets. I don't. No, it's open to the public. Okay, great. Very good. It's from two to four on mm -hmm. May 9th. Okay. Maybe you could put that information in the chat so we can, everybody can see it. That would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, anything from Denver uh, County? Did you say something? Mindy? Oh, I was going to give you a Rappahoe County. And oh, Andrea, Rappahoe, had her, right. Andrea had her had her hand up too. So okay, Arapahoe. Andrea, you want to do it, or you want me? I'm not sure what you're going to report. I do want to report that Arapahoe County and the city of Centennial are going halvesies on a homeless, oh dear, I can't think of what the middle word is, homeless coordinator who is reaching out to the homeless around the city and county and getting them services. It's not particularly for seniors, but I'm sure seniors are involved. Okay. Barbara, what do you have? I was just going to mention that um, we've decided to go to meetings every other month instead of every month so that we can work on encouraging more seniors to attend. We're doing panel discussions at those meetings because they've really turned out to be kind of networking meetings with a lot of providers. And we really want to get more seniors involved. And we're so we'd be doing six a year, except we always, with Don and Akan and the rest, um, go out to buyers in June to do a joint meeting to help the people out on the Eastern Plains. We're doing a, a food drive. So we will be bringing lots and lots of food with us and have some good presentations there. That's it. Okay, thanks, Barbara. Lisa Smith has a, a comment about homeless navigation. Um, Lisa, um, who are you visiting with or from? I'm sorry, I guess my name on the thing is Lisa. It's Lisa for right now. I was Lisa Smith and then I got married and had a baby. So I had to conform. So, uh, <laughs> no, I just wanted, I think the lady was struggling to figure out what the middle word was. And I was wondering if she meant homeless navigation, that person that's going to coordinate on the ground uh, with homeless people. That was just my clarifying point. Also, nice to see you, Bob. We served on uh, Colorado Senior Lobby years ago. So I'm back. Nice to see you too. Lisa, yeah, could, hi, you, nice. could you Good spell your last you name for me? F-E-R-E-T. So the T is silent. Oh, okay. All right, Lisa. So Thanks. you're French now, right? I'm French and I'm fancy. I even got bangs this week. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. That's so French. Okay, uh, Rich. Hi. <laughs> what do you want to know? <laughs> I just Every, got on. <laughs> whatever you have to tell us, Rich. So um, we have this document that you prepared that starts with Senate Bill 24-040. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about that. Now, uh, Do you want take, me to pull it up? It'll take most of the conversation, but yeah, go ahead. Okay, I will find it and share it here. House Bill 20, uh, 1052 is on here, too, just so you know. And then 1211, 1211 is the last one. Yeah. Is the last one. Um, so let me actually, let me talk about the others real quick, because I can get through the others, I think, fairly quickly. And we'll save Senate Bill 40 for last. <laughs> if okay. I can. Um, yeah, that's fine. Uh, House Bill 1052 is the senior property tax, housing property tax credit. Um, that I, I believe it's a two-year uh, credit 
Um, it might be, it might just be one year, uh, but it's similar to a bill that they did, I think two sessions ago, it's essentially, um, uh, on a, it's a way to get some housing related tax relief to older Coloradans who don't get access to the senior property tax exemption or what most people call the homestead exemption. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a lot of uh, eff or, uh, efforts at the end of that session, uh, basically to uh, create tax credits to use up uh, as uh, Tabor refund mechanisms. And um, at the time, I think it was Senator or Representative Degree Kennedy who had the idea that, hey, you know, why not uh, try to help seniors? Um, and was like, yeah, good idea. <laughs> um, and um, it wanted to focus it though um, on those who don't get the property tax exemption. So basically it's, it was available to renters uh, and it was available to people who, uh, you know, might've been over 65, but hadn't lived in their home for more than 10 years and those who may be qualified at one time and moved. Um, and so that passed and it was only for one year. Um, this year, again, there's a lot of efforts to um, do basically targeted Tabor refunds and with, with tax credits for certain you know, categories of taxpayers. And this, this again is one of them. And uh, so Dr. Cogbor has taken a position to support that. Um, it's now in house uh, appropriations committee and we should start to see it moving through the process soon. I have not heard that, you know, any problems with it at this point. So that's that bill. And the next one is 1211. Yep. Yes. Okay. So 1211 um, was a bill that came up and uh, it was really an idea that, um, that my lobbyist and I worked on with uh, Senator Zenzinger on, and the JBC in January when they were doing the um, the uh, fiscal or you know the current fiscal year supplemental bills, and uh, it was you know on the heels of the problems that occurred with the meal providers in a provider in Adams County that I'm sure you all know about have heard about, um, and um, they were willing. Uh, JBC ended up was willing to create an emergency reserve fund that could be tapped in in the future if there's an emergency. And um, they were able to come up with $2 million as an initial funding for it out of the current fiscal year's budget. Um, and then and when they were doing the long bill, they put in another $2 million because the stat, that's the way the statute's written, is it's supposed to be $2 million uh, each year available for these emergencies. And, and that bill um, was passed and signed by the governor. So that's available, uh, but it's one of those things where I wish I could tell you more, but it, it all happened so quickly. Uh, we don't even know how this bill is gonna be introduced or uh, implemented yet. And I don't know, if uh, the department has reached out to the AAAs to work on the process for uh, implementing this bill uh, or not, um, I, but I haven't heard that they have, um, but it would certainly be a good idea uh, to get moving uh, quickly on, uh, on this because I'm, from what I'm hearing, there's, there's a lot of uh, emergencies probably already existing and I wouldn't be surprised if there's more coming up in the coming months. So so Rich, yeah. What what impact, if if any, and I assume there will be some, um, does this bill have on 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 Senate Bill 40? I mean, it shouldn't of... it shouldn't have any. Oh okay. um, but um, you know depending on who you are you might link it. I mean it, it it's 
it should be separate. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Um, and then actually there should be one more. Uh, maybe it didn't get on there. Uh, or maybe one more was added by the Dr. Cog board uh, after this was sent out. Um, the Dr. Cog board, we presented a House Bill 1322 to them uh, last Wednesday at their board meeting. Um, it's 1322 and it's a bill that relates to, well, basically it, it uh, requires uh, HICPUF to do a feasibility study of adding uh, what, what the bill refers to. And I think you guys have all heard these terminologies, uh, uh, health related social needs, which is also connected to the term uh, social determinants of health. And the bill specifically uh, refers to housing and nutrition, and food uh, services. Um, and I think the idea is basically to uh, use, yeah, do a feasibility study to see if it makes sense to apply, I think it's called an 1115 waiver, which is like innovative programs that um, Medicaid at the federal level can, uh, I think is encouraging actually, uh, but they, they would make an application to Medicaid to say, we want to engage with uh, various providers, uh, the, the um, sponsor of the bill described them to me as non-traditional Medicaid type providers. So, so it would be, and, and he said, yeah, I think it would be triple A's and the types of providers that triple A's work with um, definitely could be considered as being part of this. But I under, as I understand it, it's, a, would be a way for the state to like bundle uh, and take an account of all the different programs that it has that provide for housing or housing assistance uh, and meals and other food and nutrition programs that I think would relate to people or be provided for people who are kind of in that Medicaid type category, uh, but then have the state then apply to the feds. And if it gets approved, then the feds would take a look at that amount of money and match it. So we could double the amount of funds available for providing these, you know, non-medical kinds of services. And the board did approve that. And so I think that one is also in, it passed out of the house committee and that one's in the house appropriations committee. Um, so it could, it could turn out to be a very interesting opportunity um, if, if it turns out that they do in fact pursue this waiver. So if, if that were to happen and you speak, and it wouldn't happen unless there was a match from the feds, right? Is that correct? Right. Right. Okay. So the feds would have to approve the waiver. And then once they approve the waiver, then we'd be eligible for the federal match. And then the, the legislature would have, to, or, or HICPUF would have to find the money to make the match. Well, the idea is, I think the idea is that we'd be able to take credit for the amount of money that we're using now for these services, because the bill does have language in there about um, making sure that um, it would be but what they call budget neutral for Colorado. So I think that's where you get the idea of um, the state would be able to take credit for the funding that it has right now and then get the, the feds to, to match it. Okay. Bill, did you have a question? Uh, boy, is my hand my hand still up? But <clears throat> I, I do I do have um, one at, at some point in time, Rich. Um, I know it's it, and while we still have some uh, board members, and congratulations, Win, uh, on yours is um, the housing bill or bills. Mm -hmm. uh, are there and uh, there certainly has been uh, some 
uh, dissatisfaction on the part of local elected officials, which are city and county folks. Uh, and knowing that there's some 100,000 to 200,000 shortfall in senior appropriate or older Coloradans appropriate housing in the state, uh, you might want to com comment on what's it look like uh, because we have debating opinion page articles <clears throat> coming from uh, even some folks in the JBC versus a local official. Yeah, I think that, I mean, what obviously Dr. Cog has been involved in the various bills um you know part of the you know participating in the stakeholding uh process that the governor has been doing on behalf particularly of uh what's what's uh um house bill 1313 um the the transit oriented communities bill and um we've been providing comments on that the dr cog board has ended up in uh a monitor but discretion to amend position um, on that bill. And um, so there's that one. There's, uh, and, and as I think a lot of you know that unlike last year, a lot of the bills, um, the big bill was broken up basically into smaller bills. <laughs> um, and so one of the other pieces, that, um, legislation on ADUs, um, that uh, our board has a position of amend on. So I think I think I would characterize the general attitude is that uh, there's there's most of the bills probably fine. But again, it's one of those issues like with 1313 is feeling that it doesn't really take uh, or give enough credit to the work that, uh, a lot of local governments already have done and are, are continuing to do and, and doesn't really give credit for those. And so there's still some um, unwelcome preemptions in, in the bill. Uh, so I know that there's some there's efforts to try to uh, address those issues through amendments. <clears throat> um, but that bill also, I believe, is in house. It's passed out of the House Committee and is in House Appropriations, I believe. Um, and then there's uh, a bill that, um, a, more of a planning related bill that takes the parts of, of the bill from last year that I think were pretty non-controversial for the most part, dealing with um, having um, re or requiring housing needs assessments and then housing needs plans, and then including um, some a couple of new required elements in uh, local comprehensive plans. Um, and so th there's a bill that really was uh, uh, initiated by Colorado Municipal League. And it's it's how, uh, Senate Bill 174 uh, with the uh, sponsors of Senator Zinzinger and Senator Kirk Meyer in the Senate and the House, uh, Representative Bird and Representative Pugliese. And um, and so it 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 does require uh, the Department of Local Affairs to develop uh, um, re you know relevant data um, and sort of a template for these housing yeah. these uh, assessments and plans. This they're they're supposed to do a state uh, one, and then there are there's there's permissive I think to do regional ones and then they're required to do local ones so there's also talk about if if you do a local one you you can have the option whether or not to participate in a regional one or maybe if the if there's going to be a regional housing needs assessment and, and plan uh, could you as a local just opt into that and not have to do a separate local one because could be burdensome for some local communities um, so since it's a CML bill, I think they're, they're going to listen to input that they get from the local governments. Um, but that bill um, is, uh, in, has, a, is, has, has a hearing next week, and we've actually offered some amendments 
to them. We're going to be talking to their, their staff this afternoon uh, about some Dr. Cog amendments for that. Um, those are the main ones off the top of my head right now. There are probably one or two others that, that I'm not thinking of. Uh, Rich, before you uh, lose uh, sight and just move to Senate Bill 40. Yeah. <laughs> provide a briefing of update on uh, what's happening within the JBC and the legislature between long-term AAA funding. <laughs> particular well, these two, those two are connected. So I will discuss them at, uh, together. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so let me see what the other hand is up for. <laughs> it's, uh, Ed Moss, you had a question? Uh, yeah. No, it's a general question. When you get done, Rich, I'll, I'll ask it. Oh, okay, okay. So the bad news is, is they've closed the long bill. They didn't do anything for senior funding, uh, senior services funding. Um, they, they have set aside uh, a total of $25 million for bills and appropriations. I'm assuming that means $12.5 million for House appropriations and $12.5 million for Senate appropriations. Um, so we, have, we basically have two options that I can pitch <laughs> to the group today. Um, one is we can pursue a long bill amendment. Um, the process allows basically for floor amendments, typically, um, um, I mean, somewhat unlike other bills, um, it, I haven't seen very often amendments put on in the appropriations committee. Uh, they generally do them on second reading uh, and the bill will be introduced in the house this year. Um, and so one option for us, and, and it's one we're seriously discussing is to um, get sponsors in the house to offer um, the $5 million as an amendment to the long bill when it gets on the floor in second reading, which I'm guessing would be next Thursday, maybe, because um, it's I'm hearing that it's going to be introduced uh, in the House on Tuesday, and um, and then we'd have to do it if we were successful and and get it on the bill, then we'd have to do it again in the House because also the process is once the bill gets to the second chamber, usually um, the appropriations committee, which is again, the, the uh, committee of reference, um, strips all the amendments that were put on in the, in the first house. So you got to do it all over again in the second chamber. And so we, then we'd have to lobby the Senate to uh, amend the bill. And then usually after the bills passed both chambers, then it goes to conference committee. And the conference committee typically is the joint budget committee. And so usually what they do, the only, usually the only amendments they accept, I mean, typically they could just ignore them all because they are the conference committee. But usually what they do is they, again, they strip everything off, go back to the bill as introduced. Uh, but typically they will approve amendments that got passed in both houses. And so that's why you've got to work that uh, and get, get that. So it's, it's, a, it's again, it's a long shot uh, and it's a lot of work because you got to lobby everybody in both houses uh, over a two week period. And, um, but it's not impossible. Um, the other option, and maybe they're not mutually exclusive um, but maybe time-wise, sequentially, if it's working on a floor amendment um, for the long bill. But then the second step is what do we do about Senate Bill 40? And Senate Bill 40 is sitting in the House, or sorry, the Senate Appropriations Committee, like so many other bills. I think I saw something yesterday saying that total for both the House and Senate Appropriations Committees, there are 150 bills. Now, some of them are a few hundred thousand dollars, but some of them are a few million dollars like ours. And when you've got, um, let's assume $12.5 million in the Senate and you've got bills 
totaling, uh, I heard one estimate a while back, um, bills and Senate Appropriations Committee totaling up to $80 million. It's obvious that um, very few, certainly of the larger bills are gonna get funded at their original amount, if at all. So we could still have an option um, to um, try to convince the Senate when they prioritize the legislation or, or the appropriations bills to make Senate Bill 40 a high priority and see what kind of funding we can get out of that process. Um, we're even thinking about lobbying the Senate Appropriations Committee, urging them to just pass Senate Bill 40 with the $5 million appropriation and continue to work on identifying a funding source for the full amount. Again, these are all really long shot kinds of efforts, but, and they're probably, you know, really uh, low probability of being successful, but um, it's either that or just give up and, and um, try again for next year. The other piece of uh, Senate Bill 40, which, which we don't wanna lose sight of is the part that deals with uh, what I keep calling the long-term long stability and the long-term sustainability of the funding. Um, Cause we all know, right? The funding's not adequate um, and, and the state hasn't really addressed that inadequacy either in the immediate case, but also over, you know, over the future fiscal years. And so the bill would require the, the Department of Human Services to work with OSPB, the Office of State Planning and Budgeting and the AAAs uh, over the next few months. And I know it's a tight time frame, but um, it's an immediate concern, right? So um, have them do an uh, uh, evaluation of the adequacy of the funding and report to um, House and Senate Human Services Committee um, and to the Joint Budget Committee and um, on you know what what the evaluation would be and, and possible recommend recommendations for addressing the long term funding. Um, so that part is still in the bill. We're having some discussions about adding some details to what that evaluation would look at. Um, that, so that could come as an amendment. We haven't decided on that yet. Um, there's, there's questions also being raised about the part that requires the appropriation or the state funding for senior services line item to be adjusted for inflation every year. Um, at this time, there's no plans to do anything about that, but there have been some concerns raised about that as well. So anyway, so we still got those two pieces uh, of Senate Bill 40, so it's still important. So one of the things that I'm planning to do uh, the rest of today, and I'll start with, with you guys, um, and that is um, to, once again, and how many times have we done this now since last year, um, uh, urge people to contact, in this case, the appropriations committees and um, in the House and Senate, both, and really all of, uh, or as many of the members of the legislature as you can, because they're all gonna be involved in this conversation about what bills do we prioritize uh, in appropriations. They're all gonna be part of this conversation about um, are there any of these floor amendments that we wanna support? And um, if they start hearing again <laughs> from, uh, uh, all of the rest of you, and I'm going to contact all the triple other triple A's and say they need the, they need to hear from you so that when they meet to discuss the long bill or 
or meet to discuss bills and appropriations, they've, they've heard over and over and over again how important it is to prioritize. And that's the key word is they need to prioritize um, state funding for senior services. Uh, Rich, can, this is a corollary, which is um, asking you to maybe get together with Kelly and uh, put together a packet for us so we can help it be focused. Uh, who's on the appropriations committee? Uh, yeah, no, we, what we would do is I would do more. You just froze up to the work <laughs> to figure out some way. Uh, uh, oh, did I? Yeah. Well, no, you're not frozen anymore. Okay. So we would need to, I mean, we need to move quickly because if we're going to do this, I really want people to start contacting uh, legislators and, and as soon as possible. <laughs> And the second item, including, yeah, and in and the second item is uh, looking back at uh, the housing needs bill, and uh, that was sponsored by CML. Uh, yeah, he's, uh, possibly looking for an amendment to that to look to uh, highlight the needs for older Coloradans. So I can I should have said that before. Let me back up a minute on that. So I, you know, I think some of you know, um, I worked last year, partly on behalf of Dr. Cog, also on behalf of the Colorado Center for Aging, and along with um, the Age Friendly Communities Subcommittee at the Colorado Commission on Aging to come up with some uh, draft language specifically on that, um, adding age friendly language, let's say, into Senate Bill 213 last year. Um, this year, we took that those basic concepts and definitions and language and um, communicated the, the interest to the sponsors of those bills uh, to do the same thing. There um, was actually the, the governor's folks listened to us pretty well. And there's, I think, some pretty uh, decent language, at least consistent with what we had in 213 last year. That is in House Bill 1313, the Transit Oriented Communities Bill. I sent some of the same types of language to CML a couple of weeks ago. And um, they have told me that, um, in fact, I had a communication this morning with a question on some of that language, that that language is going to be incorporated into some amendments to 174 that are going to be um, presented by the sponsors in committee. And so we'll see how, and, and there's still going to be opportunity because those bills are still in the first house and they haven't even um, gone on to second reading in the first house. So there'll still be opportunities if we think the language that's in those bills could be beefed up more um, we'll have opportunities to do that. So uh, something that uh, maybe Mindy and Kelly can remind me to do next week <laughs> is to put put together uh, like a summary of the age friendly amendments um, that we that we have gotten or will get into those bills. <clears throat> so on. So anyway, so so on action alerts, I, I think we do need to. Um, just make sure that everybody in, 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 in the House and the Senate is aware that this is still an issue and, and um, needs to be supported and prioritized, again, is the key words for us. They need to hear that. <clears throat> and so we will work out. And I'm going to be contacting, you know, AARP and Alzheimer's groups and um, um, Gerontological Society and others uh, to do a uh, you know, uh, action alerts, I guess. And actually, you know, uh, I think if, depending on, on your willingness and um, skills at social media, I think it's also uh, a good time to do social media. Uh, and, um, and again, it's gotta be all of our communications and what we'll, we come up with as far as the action alert has to be in a positive light, right? So it, ha it, it has to be, um, you know, we know that you've supported us in the past or you've been, um, you know, supportive of senior services, uh, but we need you again this time. 
And um, so anyway, we'll, we still got, need to craft that language. I need to do that yet today. But that's, I think, well, our, our last shot. And it'll, it's about a two-week process maybe by the time the bill goes through the House next week, should, should go, and then the Senate the following week, and then the Joint Budget Committee uh, Conference Committee is probably early the, the week after that. So, and then Senate Bill 40 could be put, put up in the appropriations sometime during that time, but it might not be, a lot of the bills and appropriations won't be calendared until the long bill is completely done. So that's it. <laughs> I, okay. I, I wish this was long over with before, but Sometimes things don't work out that way. Well, we, we were obviously hoping to hear some uh, encouraging news. But, yes, um, I was hoping to be able to give some, but. Okay, well, Ed, Ed, Ed you've been holding your, your, your hand there for a while, so yeah. it's time. Uh, Rich, I think, I'm not sure, but I think I heard a news report on one of the TV channels about the state economist estimating that state revenues are going to be down by some hundred million plus. Uh, a, am I hallucinating again, or is there something to that? And, and secondly, will it, how will it affect us? Yeah, the, the, real, the real question is how, to, how does it affect us? I, I think um, it's actually, uh, it, was, it was like a hundred million more, not less. Um, but it, it didn't really matter because um, when you're in a situation where the budget or the revenue picture is already over the Tabor spending limit, and so you're in a refund situation, um, any additional revenue just goes right into the refunds. And it, it, and it can be made, and it is made worse this time because you often will have a situation at the same time where cash fund revenues, all the different fees that are out there with cash fund, fund revenues increase, that still goes into that calculation. And Again, the Tabor refund is being paid out of the general fund. So even though cash funds have gone up, the Tabor refund for the cash funds doesn't come out of the cash funds. It comes out of the general fund. So it's not just the general fund revenues. It's also the cash fund revenues that factor into that. And um, in this case, works against us. Um, but there's also there was also discussions and and I haven't followed every piece of the conversations the last couple of weeks or the last week, but I heard some uh, um, discussions where they, some of the recalculations they've done did show that, um, that they actually had some revenue above the required reserve that maybe they could use, but there was no discussion about what they were going to use that money for and so there there was i think a lot of decisions that they made to put money in certain places instead of us because i'm you know when you're in a as i've often said when you're in a balanced budget type of uh, process uh, everybody's taking money away from everybody else because it's a, you know it's a zero-sum game and so if they decide to prioritize uh funding for for one program uh then that's money that's not available for other programs so that's why i want to start talking more about prioritization yeah jim yeah it, it it may be a subset of seniors but they're an income tax credit for like you know grandparents taking care of grandkids mm -hmm. is that is there data out there on how much that could uh that weren't in there a bill out there to take and use yeah you know there are a couple of other things yeah that um 
I know. Well, in terms of the data, I wouldn't be surprised if AARP might be able to break that out because I know they even nationally uh, produce uh, data on, uh, you know, like the cost and the cost savings of family caregiving. And um, I would, it would be interesting to see if the, if if they have data on the 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 like you say the sort of the other direction the grandparents helping with taking care of, of grandchildren. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's also a bill that um, makes changes to what's called the PTC rebate. And, uh, and I think some of you know, there's a, there's a program in the state that's been around since the seventies. I think the full name for it is the property tax rent heat rebate credit. So we all just call it the PTC rebate um, because people, fill out the PTC 104 form <laughs> that Department of Revenue produces. And it's really for very, very, very low income seniors and people with disabilities um, that you can qualify for a, a small amount. And I think it usually maybe is a few hundred, few hundred dollars a year. Sorry for the background noise if you're hearing that. Um, that uh, that they can qualify for, and um, and then there's a small am uh, amount that you can also qualify for that is intended to offset your like fuel costs and heating costs, but that one is also available to renters as far as well as homeowners. Um, Representative Weissman and his other co-sponsors have a bill that takes the portion of that program specifically for people with disabilities and turns it into a tax credit. And um, it bumps up the amount that, of credit that you can get a little bit and it bumps up the uh, income levels to where you can qualify a little bit. I think they're, they were tweaking some of it to get the fiscal note uh, acceptable, but um, and it's being supported by, you know, the uh, uh, major uh, disability advocacy groups, I think, because they feel their, their experience has been uh, people are more likely to um, fill out a form that has a tax credit instead of something that looks like they're just asking for, uh, you know, a, um, a handout or something. Uh, but also it's just the, 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 the utilization of it would be higher. And then also they can uh, increase the amount. So that one's being, and then I think the intent of the sponsors either next year or maybe the next year uh, to do that with the whole rest of that program for uh, older adult part of that program. If it looks like that, 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 this actually is better than the system that we have in place now. Um, then the only other, the other one I think that, that a lot of the senior groups are paying attention to is related to portability of the homestead exemption. And that's been an issue that I think has been pretty universally uh, supported uh, to make that portable. So you know that the, uh, the, constitutional amendment that was passed in 2000 says that you have to be 65 you have to have lived in your own and lived in your property for 10 years and then you can get um, essentially a hundred thousand uh, dollar reduction on in your um, assessed value um, and I think I think for the most part, that usually translates into something like $600 to maybe six to $800 or something a year reduction in your property taxes. And so the concern has always been, or the complaint has always been that, um, again, it's not portable. So that if you got to wait, you know, lived in your home for 10 years, but if you do live in your home for 10 years, it's kind of like right about the time that you might be thinking about downsizing and moving into something smaller or, you know, or whatever. Um, and you could still use that, that benefit. You're going to lose it because you move. And so 
there, there have been two ways of looking at that. One is you could obviously have a constitutional amendment that you put before the people to change the provision in the constitution. Um, and there, there's, um, there is a concurrent resolution, a house concurrent resolution 1001 uh, that would do that. And a companion bill 1166 that I think has implementing or conforming statute changes. Uh, the problem with that is 1166 has already been killed in committee and um, the, cons uh, the concurrent resolution hasn't been calendared. So I I'm assuming that neither of those are gonna go through, but will very likely go through um, is another bill that I think is Senate Bill 111 that essentially doesn't mess with the constitutional provisions in that program, but it just sets up a parallel statute that is a tax credit that basically says um, the people who can qualify for this tax credit are people who essentially don't qualify for the senior property tax exemption. And so it could be all those people who've moved or haven't lived in their house 10 years, you're over 65, um, and, so, and it also could apply for renters. And so you can apply for this, this tax credit that, actually I'm guessing, I'm trying to think maybe if it doesn't apply for renters because I think if you're a homeowner anyway, um, it still amounts to that same, uh, they have an equivalent calculation that amounts to that same um, benefit of the $100,000 deduction. So that bill, that Senate Bill 111 is the one that's likely to pass. So there is a, there's okay, a few Rich. little things. So anyway, sorry I couldn't provide better news. We just got, and, and all I did was give us all more work to do. Well, we, we know what we need to do now. So um, I hope everyone will do it. And I, I would be interested somewhere down the line, just in seeing a list of all this $85 million that's sitting in appropriations to see, you know, <laughs> it would just be pretty interesting to see what's in there. But in any event, thanks, Rich. Uh, I know right. you're, you're busy and you, you need to go on, but uh, thanks for thanks for being here and uh, sharing all this uh, wonderful information. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and I see Kelly on there, so she's going to be hearing from me here shortly. <laughs> Okay. Right. Isn't this supposed to be your day off? I don't know, but I don't put her to work, I think. Yep, I'm I'm there for you. Okay. All right. We'll be talking. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thanks again. Okay. All right. Take bye bye. Um, okay, so uh I see that uh Donna Zimmerman has joined. Donna. Yes, hello. Hi there. Welcome. See me? Yes. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'm gonna try to up keep things as upbeat as possible for you guys after um, that great, that conversation. But uh, we just really appreciate Rich and what you guys are doing and all the efforts. And so upfront, thank you and kudos to everyone on this advisory committee. Thank you. Would I be able to share my screen? Is that? Uh, Mindy? We can see if that works for us. It didn't work before. I'm not sure. I'm having some real problems with Zoom today, so let me see if I can. It does, oh yeah, here we go. All right, now I'll see if you can share. Okay, let's give it a whirl. I practiced a little bit, so hopefully this works. Can you see that? It's coming. There you go. We got it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, this is this is great. We're off to a great start. Um, my name is Donna Zimmerman, and I am the executive director at Southwest Improvement Council. Um, once again, thank you for having me today. I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about Southwest Improvement Council, uh, where we were and and where we've been and where we are today. Um, We've been kind of on a mission the last couple of years to uh, not reinvent ourselves, but really fine tune our services and and also uh, bring our our look and and get our get ourselves a little bit more known within the community. 
um, by, uh, we got some funding last year to build a new website, create some new marketing materials. So um, we're just, we're really excited about that. And I'll get, I'll bring that full circle when I get to the end. Uh, the first, the first slide I just uh, want to share, it's probably pretty small, but we moved um, in February of 2023 to our new location at 5045 West First Avenue. Um, for those who don't know, we operated out of the Westwood Community Center for approximately 20 years prior to that. So that top picture, uh, we really, really wanted to ensure that the individuals who are coming to our daily activities and lunch at Westwood would come with us to our new location in Barnum West. And I'm happy to report that we, you know, we were very successful in that effort. We basically uh, retained 85 to 90 percent of those folks who were pretty, who were regulars in that area. Um, we're not that far. We're less than two miles from Westwood, just a little bit further northwest. So for some folks actually who had to walk, who could walk to Westwood, they can now, they have to drive, but we had folks who were driving to Westwood who can now walk from our surrounding neighborhoods. So our last day um, was Friday, February 3rd, 2023, and we released balloons. Uh, that top picture is is us, is our, is our older adults outside of Westwood Community Center releasing their balloons, kind of in honor of our time there and to set the stage for something new. Um, and then we we moved that weekend and we didn't skip a beat. We served lunch on the coming Monday on February 6th. Um, the below picture is our holiday event, our recent holiday event um, lunch and program. We had kiddos from St. Mary's Academy come in and sing and provided a nice meal. So we've been, uh, and I'm going to get to to our numbers. Um, we've we've uh, we've been slowly increasing our numbers since we've been here. Um, so that's kind of an introduction. Uh, as I noted, we've been really working to stream streamline our purpose and and uh, you know what what we really want to focus on in the beginning when SWIC was founded in 1987, and then we were we we uh, received our 501c3 in 1988. So we've been around for over 35 years now, and um, over those years, and when Jan Bell founded it we did, there were a lot of different focuses and a lot of different things the organization did, but we've really tried to streamline that in the last couple of years. So I just, I, I, I just want to share what our purpose statement is right now. Um, we're, we're dedicated to enhancing the lives of all Southwest Denver residents with a focus on improving quality of life. We have always adapted to the changing demographics and needs of the neighborhoods we serve. Our goal is to address challenges with an equ equity lens and be an active participant along with other like-minded organizations in finding solutions. Two of the most important challenges facing our community today are the increasing number of older adults age, age 60 plus and the affordable housing shortage. We are committed to preserving culture, assisting older adults in aging in place and making home ownership attainable for all as we continue to improve the quality of life in Southwest Denver. Um, that said, drilling down to our mission statement to empower individuals, improve the quality of life and advance human rights by addressing inequities in the communities we serve, uh, we are we are streamlined and solely focused pretty on older adult programming and home ownership. So our home ownership program has two components, uh, home buyer education and housing counseling. We are a HUD certified housing counseling agency with a HUD certified housing counsel counselor on staff. Um, so we provide monthly home buyer education classes and uh, Lance also does, uh, does housing counseling for individuals who are have experiencing problems making their mortgage. They may be delinquent, they may be uh, at, at risk of foreclosure. He also does a little bit of rental counseling and some pre-purchase counseling as well. So that's just the other side of what we do. And I wanted to share it. And I know and housing is important to all of us, the affordable housing crisis. So I know Rich was just talking a little bit about that. And we know that some of our older adults are experiencing um, issues in finding places to live as they downsize as well. So uh, for today, we're focused on our older adult programming. Um, at Southwest Improvement Council, we understand the transformative power of social connections. 
our dedicated programs and activities are designed to foster meaningful interaction, provide opportunities for personal growth and create a vibrant community for our older adults age 60 plus. We firmly believe that social connections play a vital role in enriching life for our older adults. Research shows that as we age, maintaining an active social life becomes increasingly important to overall well-being. And that brings us to what we do on a daily basis here at Southwest Improvement Council. Um, Monday through Friday, we are we have activities on a daily basis. We Monday, Wednesday, Friday are big bingo days. Our older adults really enjoy bingo, um, and we do other games as well. Those kinds of things all you know help to. Uh, 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 increase cognitive abilities and things like that. We do lots of creative expression through art, art classes and craft project classes. We've got a, uh, a, a sewing craft group that meets every Wednesday afternoon. Um, and they just, they do sewing projects, but they also work on a number of different kind of craft projects. Um, we've got uh, one of my colleagues here is a is very into plant care and we've got lots of plants around here so he does classes on how to propagate how to transplant properly and just general care for plants and different projects that have that involve that um, our biggest and one of the biggest things we're focused on is nutrition um, we are a partner with volunteers of america and they deliver a hot lunch monday through friday which we then serve here um, and then we also to we also provide a monthly food pantry. Um, we had really increased this during COVID um, with, of course, as everybody did with federal funding. But we're, we in the in the aftermath of COVID, funding for that aspect is is hard to come by. But we've managed to keep it going at least once a month, and that that pantry is not age restrictive. So we're there for. Um, other community residents, um, we've got families that come to that. Um, but again, it, we do, it's just once a month, but we, we, we're trying to keep it going. We also do, you know, we know how, how important it is that that our, the individuals who come to see us exercise and, and stay strong in their bodies. We provide chair yoga a couple times a week. If my yoga instructor can't get here, we we do some movement and strengthening exercises. I've got another individual who comes in in it when she can't make it sometimes. And we also try to back that up. I forgot to put it on here with music. We um, we have music sometimes um, for our activities. Uh, these folks love to dance, and they they have they really enjoy when we have music um, available for them. Um, we're trying to implement some technology-based classes. Um, we've been going back and forth with that. Again, one of my colleagues has he started a you know a technology class where we had uh, just tried to build on some basic skills for computer for computer navigation, and and we're we're finding that we some things work and some things don't work. So we're continuously trying to reinvent what we're offering and trying to bring it to fruition so we can offer um, things that are engaging and that that they enjoy and that are also once again uh, utilize, utilizing the socialization aspect, getting them in community and getting them gathered with each other to engage themselves in whatever they're interested in. And then two of our biggest, uh, the biggest aspects of what we do is our Native American community gatherings and our Asian American community gatherings. So once a month, and we uh, do uh, a, a, an afternoon gathering for Asian American community. We have a nice meal for them, and we try to um, provide either some presentation or um, something culturally related. We've done art projects and music and things like that. Um, we work with the Denver Indian Center sometimes to bring in um, like-minded speakers and things like that. So that's been something SWIC has done for, I think, for many, many, many years. Uh, again, I, I joined I joined uh, SWIC, I don't know if I mentioned this, in August of 2022. So um, still kind of getting up to speed on all of the history, but I know we've been providing this activity for a long time. In 2023... 
we saw a huge need in our with our Asian American community. Um, one of the, another individual on my staff is uh, Vietnamese, and she's been instrumental in helping us bridge that communication gap. And we started out by having a Chinese New Year in January of 2023, and it was so well accepted. We had like 35 folks who came that we decided to make that also a monthly event. And we've continued that throughout 23 and now into 24 with our second, doing our second Chinese New Year just this past uh, January. Um, and these these individuals are just so fun. They really, what one of the most fun things that we do together is karaoke. Um, they love to, they love to sing and we have one of the members who's donated a, a karaoke machine for for this activity. So it's been really fun to build this and to build this community and our connection with this community. Um, that brings us kind of down to, I know that with um, everything that you're working on, we're in, always interested in numbers and you know where are we and, and what are we doing you know, today, um, just touching back to we moved in uh, in February of 2023, but we're still serving Southwest Denver. Um, I, we are in West Barnum, and so the immediate neighborhoods are Barnum, West Barnum, and our and our Westwood communities are for the individuals who come on a daily basis. Um, our, our, we are our Native American elders who visit us. Um, once a month, and then we have some of those individuals who also come to our daily activities. They span Metro Denver, with, uh, Adams, Arapahoe, and Jefferson, as well as Denver County. So uh, we are touching a, a lot of different areas in, in uh, Metro Denver. Unduplicated served. Um, I've got two numbers up there. Uh, for the Dr. Cog year ending um, in uh, June of 2023, we served 273 unduplicated. We also utilize a software called Senior Space because we track a lot of other things for other grantors and just for our own impact purposes. So um, for our calendar year 2023, that number for us was 276. And I just throw that out there as a little bit of a comparison that we're, you know, we really try to track this and we're on track and close and, and we're we're doing a really good job if we're only there's only three difference in our calendar year and our Dr. Cog year. Um, next, uh, the Denver's Neighborhood Equity and Stabilization, I'm sure you're all familiar, uh, other initiative otherwise known as NEST. I wanted to share a few uh, a few numbers about our communities, specifically Barnum, West Barnum, and Westwood. On average, over 12% of the households have no internet in these areas, no internet access. 25% live in poverty. 75% of household incomes are or less than 75,000 a year. Um, over 50% speak a language other than English in their homes. And for the Denver zip code 80209, which is where SWIC is located and where we were also in when we were at Westwood, um, approximately 10,000 or 15% of the population is age 60 plus or older. So to put that in perspective, SWIC served 273 unduplicated individuals for the most recent Dr. Cog year. That's literally, you know, we're, we're gaining new folks every day, but we still, think that there, we still know there's so many more out there. That's literally only 3% of this population. And that's just in the immediate neighborhoods around our facility. Um, we know, you know, we're, we're, we're always targeted, the Older Americans Act target populations. Just wanted to reiterate, those are the populations we serve on a daily basis. Um, these are individuals that live in SWIC's neighborhoods, and they come from minority populations, many living at or below the poverty level. Um, and then for the calendar year 2023, uh, of the 276 that I, I noted up above, just sharing um, some, uh, breaking that down into the minority populations we're serving, of that number, only 14% are were white. 30% identified as Hisp Hispanic Latino, 25% as Native American, American Indian, Alaska Native, 22% as Asian American, 
and 2% identified as African American or mixed others. Of the clients who attended 100 or more of SWIC's regular acti week weekday activity programming, less than 2% are white. Um, and that kind of brings me down to the end of, of what I have to share with you. Um, additionally, the most recent state of Colorado population estimates indicate that the county SWIC serves, particularly Denver, have the highest population of minority residents, age 60 plus, um, living in poverty. And for SWIC, we have always tried to be as diversified as possible with our funding. Dr. Cog makes it possible for us to serve this population. And you have, we've had, we have, a, I wanna say a 20 plus year um, partnership with you and we're so grateful. We are trying really hard to expand uh, funding options for ourselves um, and, and, and here's why for, for our current year, 2022-23, that's going to be ending on June 30th, we requested reimbursement for 5,500 units. That's roughly 450 touch points a month. However, we've been averaging 500 to 600 a month. We're currently, we estimate we're currently serving a thousand plus more um, than our contract is for. So and we've continued to do that, you know, when we do our reviews with Dr. Cog's staff, um, I came on and I was confused about what the wait list was. They had never had a wait list. And we, I worked with Mason and Travis and Sharon to, you know, identify what that was and implement the, really implement the, the policy. But it's always been SWIX, uh, SWIC's uh, desire to never turn anyone away. So we we continue to open our doors and to provide activities for these folks to um, gather and socialize and share a meal and, uh, you know, enjoy themselves and engage in in uh, activities that that they like and that, you know, again, I guess boils down to helping them age in place. Um, we have been, as I said, building our website out and trying to, with an effort or hope to try to increase our fundraising efforts in the new year. We know we need to look to other funding sources and we definitely, you know, are trying to do that. Um, Dr. Cog has been instrumental for us and um, we're going to try to help you with getting the word out to uh, uh, members of the Members of representatives in the Senate and all of that will do our best because we just we appreciate everything that you do and you make it possible for us to do what we do. But we, you know, we know that um, funding funding is going to be uh, something to look at this year and really work harder at at coming up with other options. Um, again, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Donna Zimmerman. I'm the executive director. There's my contact information. Donna Z at swick-denver.org. And I'm going to stop sharing, Mindy, and I would be happy to take any questions. I don't know if I'm at 20 minutes or not. I hopefully I'm somewhere in that vicinity. You, you made it. Thank you. Great. Uh, that was a great presentation, Donna. Um, Thanks. Very, very, great. Good information. We have a couple of minutes for questions if anybody has a question for Donna. Okay, seeing none, um, thanks once again. And uh, you're welcome to stay on as long as you wish, Donna. So uh, I, and I would absolutely love to, and, but my, we are, we wear many hats around here. I called Bingo this morning cause, cause I had someone gone. So I'm gonna continue on, but again, thank you so much for what you do for everything you do for us and all the hard work you put in. We couldn't be more grateful and thanks for having me. Oh, yes. Well, thank you for coming and, and sharing your story with us. We really appreciate it. Okay. And if anyone day. wants to connect with me on the side, um, you know, just uh, please visit our website. I'm excited about our new website. So please visit it to learn more. Thanks so we much. Will, we'll take yep. a look at it for sure. Thank you. Okay. Right. Now, um, going back to our county reports, uh, we, we heard from Arapaho and Jefferson. Um, 
Any any other county reports? Any bit that anyone on here would care to comment on? I think Greg can probably give you a better indication. Um, I know ACAN is looking at doing a resource fair. So you want to give him more information on that, Greg? We have generally set up another. We're going to do two resource fairs this year, one in uh, May and another one in October. Uh, our goal is to get out to more seniors. Uh, I'm fairly new at the uh, Dr. Cog stuff. I've been doing the ACAN stuff for three or four years. So I'm trying to get up and it's enjoyable to listen to what everybody does for the older citizens. And my goal is to make it better for Adams County. Um, uh, what's the, the bad news that came up last year without uh, the Meals on Wheels, that was not good. Uh, thank you very much for Volunteers of America because Volunteers of America stepped in uh, tremendously and to help Adams County there. So. Uh, uh, the, the legislation for getting those emergency funds would be great uh, for those emergencies that happen like that beyond all of our controls. Um, so I'm going to sit and listen and try to figure out how I can help out the best as I can with my people in Adams County and this organization. Thanks for being a part of it. Okay. Thank, thanks. Uh, thanks, Greg. Much appreciated. Uh, any Any other counties? I would like to re have any comments. Douglas, Denver, et cetera. No. Okay. Do we have anything else from any of our members? That, any other comments before we sign off for the day? Looking in the chat to make sure I'm not missing something. Um, okay. Well, if not, then uh, happy Friday, everyone, and enjoy the weekend, and um, and don't lose too much money on this uh, March Madness thing. So, <laughs> bye. Okay. Right. Bye bye. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Karen.